I mean, just look at it. It's stunning. It's such a great testament to what the right look and sound can do to a game. It's almost a shame that I truly do hate it so. From its story to its gameplay, all I feel when I play it is the result of a tech demo turned game, one with disastrous experience ruining design decisions. The tale of a game that has no idea what it actually wants to be, and one that, when it finally figures it out, fails to live up to its story heavy design with a decent narrative. But when you look at it like this, for just a moment it's easy to forget. I may critique the hell out of this game, and in my heart it will stay in a place of bitter despair for quite some time. But for just a moment, let us admire some genuine craftsmanship before we delve into its underbelly. This is the most disappointing game I've ever played in my entire life. But man, it's fucking gorgeous for it. Welcome to the world of Adrift. I waited a long time for that. After my first time playing this game, I was told by so many to wait for how great it'll at least be on the Vive. Four months later, here I am feeling yet again disappointed. Room scale motion control VR has slowly learned to flap its wings in the last half a year, and I will say that when you're not doing anything the game disapproves of and instead just sit and stare, the 3D effects melded with the already stunning visuals are just as beautifully rendered as I could have ever hoped for and, coupled with the controllers, I could finally be truly immersed in this world, grabbing oxygen and pushing buttons with my hands, giving the world that fine physical connection that would make the experience truly next level. By now, I'm sure you're already expecting the however, and you would be perfectly right in thinking so, because, however, when it comes to controls, the decisions made are a baffling example on what happens when a company refuses to give up on its preset animation systems in a game priding itself on immersion, even when the decision to actually keep said preset animations in a Vive game takes away massive proportions of that immersion. In a Drift Vive, your controllers are not your hands. Your character's hands are preset animations, and picking up items instead revolve around pointing a controller in their general direction as you go past. When you turn, your character follows the laws of imaginary physics and swims to turn. Why can't I do that? Why can't I miss the reach of that vital oxygen tank and have that vital reactionary lean to get it? Why do I feel more like a character from inside out than an actual person? The game's preset animations are pretty much all contextual button or injection animations. Ones that doing yourself would add so much more to the world you're in. That said, it's almost a good thing that you don't have to think about interactivity, as the control scheme for movement in Vive controllers is made both awkward and bizarrely complex. Now before we go on, I understand exactly what they were going for with this control scheme. It was meant to feel like one of those manned manoeuvring units that NASA have. And, in all honesty, the idea is pretty damn noble. The game becomes about mastering this awkwardness, man and machine working harmoniously as one. So why is my character not in one of these MMUs? If my character is not having to put up with this awkwardness, why must I? There are no animation changes between versions, yet us Vive owners waited over three months what is essentially a poorly thought out controller scheme that doesn't fit the situation. A great example of this is that to boost forward, the grip buttons must be pressed on both controllers while touching forward on the pad. That said, if you press the left pad in as an omnidirectional button, it is instead your scan button. Why not just make that omnidirectional pressing button the boost button? The other control schemes all have boost as a singular, easy to use button. Yet, 
Even though the situation has not changed for the main character, the entire feeling of control has been made borderline unplayable early on for the sake of not letting the user have fun with their own physical space. You can't swim with your arms or push against surfaces, even though your character is shown to do similar things throughout. The control scheme on these motion controls demands no motion. It is there just to tick off a checkbox, which is woefully sad in terms of potential. I just wanted to get to do this section first, as the video was delayed months to experience the game at its full potential before judgement. But instead, the wonderful technology of the Vive is wasted for something that is just better with a controller. If the character was shown in an MMU, I'd understand. But a refusal to make any changes whatsoever make me say this. Avoid the Vive controllers for this game like a plague, because it is clear that whoever chose these control ideas had no idea what they were doing with them. Grab a controller and enjoy some nice 3D VR. Just be wary, if you move too much instead of tracking your head with a helmet HUD, it just jerks you back to position, and there are no graphics options in VR. So if an effect is too much for your VR entry level rig, I'm sorry, but you're screwed. Anyway, Let's get on to the game itself, shall we, before we depress ourselves further with this speak of wasted potential in virtual reality. Question 1. What is a drift actually trying to be? To answer this question, please use this trailer as reference. And yes, before you answer, let me just show you this clip so we can get the thing that we're all thinking out of the way. Now, this isn't even to remotely suggest any possibility that a drift is some sort of video game version or rip-off of Gravity in any way. The film itself came out during the development cycle of the game, but I do feel it's fair to say that the film at least pushed public perceptions of what this game was trying to be in the survival horror, but the monster is space itself direction. The game itself also does this with a stark opening, a shared oxygen and movement supply, a low oxygen amount, a slowly cracking and breaking suit that is the only boundary between you and the infinite void. The early moments of a drift are scary and intimidating. Here is a massive broken space station, and you've got to find a way home. The openness of it all, and the sight of a distant object, knowing that that is what I need to get to. And now, to figure my own way there through my own wit, cunning, and skilled use of movement. Only that this feeling is particularly skin deep. Roots in a drift are strictly linear affairs. Even the openness of space is handled via lines of oxygen supplies, bar the occasionally poorly spelt out waypoint on your HUD. Although admittedly I'm not going to mark the HUD and radar against this game, as disorientation works thematically well with the whole space survival thing to be honest. And then, less than an hour, the event that signals the beginning of the slowly engulfing doomed precipice that this game is beginning to fall into happens. You fix your oxygen supply, and having learned to manage momentum and movement on low oxygen amounts, you'll now breeze through the rest of the game practically unharmed because the truth of the matter is truly revealed. This game doesn't want to be gravity. It wants to be Firewatch. Don't get me wrong, I adore the hell out of Firewatch. The walking simulator genre is one that has genuinely fascinated me for a while now, and a drift's departure from personal survival story to human story is a surprise admittedly, and one that'll turn a lot of people off. But it is not necessarily inherently bad as a change, at least in terms of trying to engage the player because, to be honest, here is also where the design of a drift gets astonishingly lazy. Walking simulators thrive on their storytelling capabilities through limited, often inconsequential interactivity. In Firewatch, for example, you go from A to B at the behest of another's instructions over and over again doing mundane tasks. 
The realism of the situation allows time and slower pacing for a deliberate and personal story. It never specifically rushes the player, and instead, rushing the player is purely a psychological affliction of their own accord. Post the stressful opening and flying of Adrift's opening moments, it is fair to say that the extra oxygen relaxes both the player and the game's pacing immensely and that you must now repair parts of the station to escape, the order in which you do this is forced upon you in a linear fashion, and the activities that fixing the station involves are, bar small obstacles when flying, essentially always find a chip, push a button, get an upgrade, repeat three more times until the end credits. The lack of variation really helps as that whole plucky survival thing is completely abandoned. The ship is essentially repairing itself and you just need to perform linear escort quests to help it. No welding, no makeshift stuff or puzzles of any sort. Go to place, watch animation of button and done. The story is non-branching or interactive either. In fact, the storytelling style feels like an unsuccessful version of the excellent analog a hate story and hate plus games, in which the game revolves around reading the blogs of the deceased. Yet, here it seems stale and lacks any sense of pathos or tension within the story itself. I feel that structurally the separation of character stories within the near progression of the four routes is what's to blame. Each zone you go through contains only one character's audio logs and files. Entering a section is the first time you hear them, leaving a section is the last. Combined with that straightforward progression approach, and the only real-time element of the story being the survival of your character which, thanks to the new pacing, now feels unimportant compared to the focus of everyone else. My disappointment in Adrift, however, does not stem from some misplaced genre wishes. The switch to narrative game is something I welcomed with open arms, and while I think that structurally the separated nature of its non-interactive story elements could provide heavy structural weaknesses in the story's presentation, let us not forget the power that a great narrative can provide when it comes to forgiving a game for dull, repetitive or uninspired gameplay. This section is by far the easiest to discuss as the nature of the game itself leaves little in terms of gameplay elements. Movement is everything, bar grabbing objects or starting contextual animation strings. The closest thing to skilled or rewarding play is using short bursts of boosting to clear large gaps via inertia alone to save on oxygen, a mechanic which post the hour mark becomes practically obsolete due to higher oxygen supply, even though the amount of oxygen resupply stations is actually kept consistent throughout, making early moments easily the toughest in the game. This means the game actually has a reverse difficulty curve thanks to the upgrades. Occasional obstacles get in the way, but it is all a simple matter of often forgiven timing. The game is trying to be experienced, and part of that is taking away any sense of player freedom. The closest thing to an interesting mechanic the game has is the idea of making exploration inherently risky thanks to the oxygen timer. Again, however, this is ruined by lack of anything really worthwhile or interesting to explore in the first place, bar what gets marked by the scanner. The closest thing to this ideology is a satellite that when you go near, you can occasionally hear radio signals. However, a huge glaring issue with this satellite is that its HUD logo is identical to the audio log logo, and due to the fact that the sound cue isn't played immediately upon a proximity sometimes, I imagine many will die a death looking for an audio log inside a satellite that actually doesn't have an entrance. It's admittedly the only time the HUD really screws the player over, so it is quite a standout issue admittedly. But it's hard to find issue in such simplicity when the game's level design never capitalises on using the movement in an interesting way or adding any depth to its systems. Movement just ends up feeling dull and the levels refuse to redeem it in anything other than the looks or rotating object that hurts a bit. For a game themed around survival against ultimate odds, there really is a severe lack of things to actually kill you. The gameplay remains unengaging and, as previously stated, the activities are all identical in all function bar which animation plays out. Grabbed objects can't be held at choice either. Objects have set times to be let go. At least tapping the grab button makes you swat things away like you're playing cat lateral damage, but it never serves any gameplay purpose other than just existing. Not batting away debris or anything like that, it's just kind of there pointlessly. The gameplay refuses to get in the way of the story. Interestingly, the logs and emails tend to be very spaced out around, so it's not like it's getting in the way of a constant barrage of storytelling. 
Perhaps then it's there to add to the atmosphere, keeping things calm and collected as opposed to frantic. So much for the whole I'm going to die out here themes then. That said, those smatters of story when they appear, I think I've honestly stalled this long enough. Let's just talk about the story of this thing so I could get that part of my nightmare over with. I shall now present a delicate and detailed synopsis of the story of Adrift. You are Alex Oshima. Apparently you'd like to see results in your work, so before the game even began, you accidentally blew up a space station with only five other people on board. Therefore, you are a bad person. Feel bad, because you be bad. You didn't do anything bad in-game, but that doesn't matter. Alex did bad thing, and you are Alex. And then a woman cries at you down a radio for a bit? I really do wish I was lying, but the whole game is genuinely an attempt to constantly hammer home the responsibility that Alex must now burden. What's great though is that the extremities to which it does this are borderline comical at points. At first it goes for the basic stuff, constantly saying, oh by the way this first guy, he had a daughter, and he loved her. Notice how much this guy talks about his daughter? Too bad he's dead now. This is followed by a hello nice female friendly patriotic scientist engineer woman. Look how happy and proud and clever she is. She's, she's dead now as well. From here on in it starts getting hilarious with its obsession on you being horrible and seeing as Alex never reacts to any of this, it begins to actually become quite funny. Basically, person 3 is saying that you're some sort of deviant or sadist in bed or something. It's vague, but your sex life is described as you doing dangerous things with him. This is only made more desperate by saying that you forgave his alcoholic past, but now he is a recovered alcoholic, and a person who just wants to help others through his trying days. Once again, now he's dead. However, this is where we get to the highlight, skipping the fifth one, because the fifth one's just simple. Fifth one is an old best friend, you two now disagree with each other, and at the end her mother gets pissy with you, but the fourth buckle up because the this game wants you to know that you're a bad person cringe reflex is about to hit hard. Okay, you ready? Here we go. The fourth is a rich old guy who wanted to see space and feel serene and one with the universe before he died of cancer. Unlike the others, he was kind of ready to die. So at first it tries to take away some of that guilt as apparently you didn't seem to get on each other's nerves or anything. And then it turns out that something, be it the space or the plant experiments or whatever, is curing his cancer. That's right, you didn't just kill five people, you stopped the cure for fucking cancer. Do you feel bad? Do you feel bad? You're bad. You suck. You're terrible. And again, the only response your character has to any of this stuff is sometimes saying the name of the characters like a broken fucking Pokemon. Now admittedly, one could argue that the your terrible nature of the story is not actually aimed at the player, but instead Alex. The problem is that Alex is so lacking in character and personality throughout, and the fact that the only dialogue she has is just reactionary utterings of a name, means that if it's trying to make you hate your character and come to gain an interesting complex of playing a character you don't like, it fails hard. To be honest, the only real sense that Alex is an actual person is that thanks to the constant preset animation change, it means that half the time you actually do hate Alex because she keeps playing the whole fucking game for you. There are games out there which actually do a really good job of making you feel bad for your own actions without necessarily just hiding information from you. They often actually play on the idea of obsession, or at least just doing things routinely. Games like Spec Ops The Line, Hotline Miami and Share of the Colossus do a brilliant job of this because they make you do these tasks, and it is you doing these tasks. You do play characters, but ultimately, you and the character get a weird both synchronisation and dissonance because you are controlling him, but you're also doing things from their point of view. It actually becomes particularly interesting because it allows you to feel guilty about your own actions. But that's the thing. The thing that Drift fails at hard in this game is the fact that it wants you to feel guilty about the actions of your character. The thing is that to feel guilty about your own actions, you actually had to have had a fucking action to begin with. 
When it comes to space travel, scientists are obsessing over the idea of plants, getting energy and oxygen from plants to allow for longer space travel and possibly some things that you can do back home with it. There's also some rich people in different corporations and also Japan is now a new country of New Japan because of some war or something that's never properly explained and really it never needs to be because who faces it? No one fucking cares because the game doesn't care either. That's the, that's it. That's the, that's the world. That's the law. We can, we're done. No, we're done. We don't have to have a minimum amount for chat. We're done. That's the law. I'm not, that's, that's all. It never does anything with it. it it's a waste. It's a complete fucking waste. New Japan's out of, it's a waste. There's, there's nothing. There's no, no, it's nothing. It's done. This is ground control to Major Tom. You really made the grade. That grade, of course, being an F. To be honest, I've been nervous about this critique for a while now. After my Steam review was Adrift's number one most helpful Steam review for this game, and after I said months ago I was to do this critique, one of the people behind the game has occasionally messaged me. He seems nice and I can tell from its looks and attention to visual detail that love truly went into this game. And I am but a random guy shooting it down, and according to the Steam polls, actively stopping people from buying it. I don't enjoy that burden at all, and yet the more I wrote, about this game, the more angry I became at it. I meant the truth when I said it was the most disappointing game in my life, and I know that some of that blame is on me for being so hyped for it, but that's what its looks and concepts just did to me. I couldn't help but want it. When I got it I streamed it in one go and despised it. I was just sad because the game had failed to make me feel anything, like space itself I just saw nothingness. The story lacked consequence, and the gameplay lacked nuance to make up for it, and now when I come back to give it another chance and my expectations still low, I still somehow felt hurt by it. The game needed writers and level designers, it needed that sense of self-preservation in both plot and mechanics, it needed more details beyond that of a beautiful picture. A great example of this is just when you self-write or turn to start an animation, Despite potential 180s in movement, the jetpack sound never plays and the oxygen never depletes for the movement. The game just kind of forgets. It wants you to look at the animation and not think about the game. And that's the thing. I can ramble on for an eternity, but ultimately that's what it truly comes down to. You can do all you like to make that sell on early atmosphere and graphics alone, but your legacy will be on what you decide to do throughout your experience as a game, and sadly just kind of forgetting about it will define the thoughts of those who play it for an eternity. Depression as a disease is different to sadness. It's the inability to feel, a numbness. A numbness that sadly I've had to put up with for a few years now. Playing Adrift was the closest thing a game ever got me to giving me that feeling again. When I think about Adrift, ultimately, this following sound is all I can hear in my head. <laughs> 